Hello, everybody. I'm Holly Shippers. I'm the manager here at in the seasonal department at Sunnyside Nursery. And to my right is... I'm Sarah. I'm in the seasonal department with Holly, and I am the container designer and plant up the containers here at Sunnyside. And yes, we have been fully vaccinated. We are not with our masks today. It's just she and I. We work closely together most days. So hopefully you can't see our mask tan lines too much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, we, we all love nature in some way, shape, or form, whether it's hiking, camping, boating, biking, or gardening. Today we're going to be talking about gardening, specifically balcony gardening. So let's get started. Uh, determine what kind of weight your balcony can hold. You know, some are built sturdier than others, so you want to make sure you're considering the weight uh, aspect of it. Now we can do some things to lighten the load, like use some, just grab the little one, like use some uh, fibercrete. This looks like it should be heavy, but it's not. It's a little fiberglass, very light. But very that, sturdy. That will help, that will help reduce some weight. Now, uh, another option would be the plastics. There's all kinds of different decorative plastics. Now this one does not have a hole, so you want to make sure you've got drainage and you can easily drill a hole in there. This is another one, kind of that terracotta decorative look. This is a self-watering one. It's got its tray on the bottom that restores the, uh, that reserves the water. This one that's more of a, a trough style, it does have holes, they have plugs in them, so when you're when you're working with plants outside, we do always recommend having good drainage. So take out those those plugs in the holes. And it's also nice and narrow for a small space, so you're not creating a, a big area being used. You now, also can we, use. We do want to to mention too, um, if you're in a condo apartment building, checking to find out how much weight that they'll allow on a balcony. And also you might want to check uh, some condos and apartment buildings do not allow gardening. So make sure you check that before you put the expense into doing it. This is an upsy daisy. This is also going to help lighten the load. It goes into the container so that you just need some soil. You know, obviously this isn't enough soil. It's just doesn't fit it correctly, but there's different sizes. Um, it's going to lighten the load so you're not filling the entire pot up with soil. Just keep in mind when you do that, that there are less resources for the plant. Your soil is going to dry out faster. You're going to run out of, of nutrition for your plant faster. So you'll have to be adding those things more. Um, also, they don't all fit perfectly in different containers. So um, we recommend buying those along with your container at the same time so you can try out and see, see which ones work together. And, and it, I do recommend it with um, like your heavier ceramic uh, pots because they can be very heavy depending on what they're made of. Uh, just make sure that um, you're not using them on, on them on things that require a deep root system. That, that would not be good. Uh, next thing you want to consider is your lighting. What kind of lighting does your balcony have? Is it shady? Is it sunny? Is it morning light? Is it afternoon light? Is it dappled? Is it filtered light? Uh, so that makes a difference as to what you'll be planting on what your lighting is. Uh, water. Where are you going to get your water from? Some balconies have a spigot, some don't. Are you going to re rely on a watering can or are you going to rely on a sink faucet hose? They're coil hoses that you attach to a faucet and then can drag it through your, your home. Uh, you know, different things to consider. That also would determine uh, what you plant. If you're going to rely on just a handheld watering can, you might want to consider drought tolerant plants. That way you're watering less often. Uh, harsh conditions. Balconies can get some harsh conditions. Uh, if it's in the full sun, it could be 15 degrees hotter. So you want to make sure you're putting plants there that won't burn. You've got a lot of hard surfaces. You've got the side of the building that could be reflecting heat. Uh, if it's uh, in the winter time and you've got perennials, shrubs, trees, whatever that are surviving through the winter, uh, you can get some harsh freezing winds. 
You want to make sure you're protecting your your pot, your pot's root, your plant's roots in the pot. You can use burlap for that. You just wrap it around the container, and it's like when we get cold, we wrap the jacket on us, and we get better. That's what you're doing basically to the root system of your plants in those containers. When we have plants down in the ground, the heat from the soil in the ground is going to help insulate that that root system. When you're up in the air on a balcony and in a container that soil and that root system is going to naturally get colder. Did you talk about moisture in the root system? Okay, you want to make sure uh, when it's freezing, before it starts to freeze, you get out there and you water that root system. That's going to help insulate it as well along with the burlap around the pot. Um, space. What kind of space do you have? Some balconies are just little, little tiny spaces. Some, my in-laws have a balcony that's, oh, probably 40 feet long. Uh, so it, space, depending on what your space is, is what you're going to do. Now, do you want to have a sitting area out there or do you want to just kind of view it from inside? Uh, so that's going to determine how many pots you can have if you want to have a sitting area out there. But if you just want to view it from outside, then you can have more containers. <laughs> so that's entirely up to you on, on what kind of a, a garden you want on your balcony. How much headroom do you have? Do you have a balcony up above you that's going to limit the height of your plants? Or um, also considering if you want things hanging, do you have something that you can put hooks on or you're able to drill into? Um, also, more things you might need to ask management if, if that's something you need to consider. Uh, time, you know, you, how much time are you going to be able to commit to taking care of your plants? Uh, some people do a plant schedule. Uh, this is very handy for those who just need schedules to go by to, as a reminder. Or if you're sharing the chores of taking care of the plants with somebody else in the home. Um, it'll let you know who watered last, who fertilized last, who groomed the plants last. Uh, when you're grooming the plants, that's like deadheading, taking the yellow foliage off. And as you're doing this, you're also checking for pests. Uh, unfortunately, gardening is nature that requires pests as well. They're just a part of nature. And you will get some at some point in your gardening experience. Um, what kind of look do you want? Do you want it to be tropical? Do you want veggies and herbs? Do you want shrubs, trees? Yes, you can have shrubs and trees on a balcony. You just have to make sure you're getting specific ones. Um, you know, you decide, just, just decide what kind of look you want. Do you want a mix of everything? You can do that too. And we're gonna give you an idea of what a mix of everything is uh, today. Um, let's start with uh, talking about uh, well, let's talk about soils and fertilizers. You want to do that now? Sure. This is a, a Edna's potting soil. This is for indoor outdoor potting of plants. It's going to have uh, peat moss in it that's going to retain some moisture. Uh, so it's not going to dry out right away. Um, it also has a mycorrhizae in it, which is a myco for fungus and mariza for roots. So it's a beneficial fungus and roots that are going to help support a strong, healthy root system that will help draw water and nutrients. <clears throat> this is a cactus mix. It's going to be uh, full of extra pumice and sand for, for more drainage. This is going to be for uh, keeping the soil a lot uh, more drained for your cactus and succulents that do not like that added moisture. One of my favorite soils, this is called 420. It also has another name called Ultimate. Right now it's the 420 that we've got in the packaging. This has, again, a mycorrhizae, which I just talked about with the beneficial fungus and roots that will help support a good strong root system. It also has microbes. Microbes are going to break down the organic uh, matter in your soils uh, that will help support a good strong uh, plant as well. 
Uh, here's a good fertilizer. This is a starter fertilizer. It's called Sure Start. This is a great one to uh, start any plant with, uh, which we do recommend for that purpose. This one is a rose fertilizer. This is a great one for when your plants are starting to bud and bloom. This is high in uh, uh, phosphorus, very good for blooming. Flower, flowering perennials, flowering shrubs. And this is one of my favorites for annuals. This is called Ultra Bloom. Ultra Bloom is a zero 10 10 which means zero nitrogen. So we're not gonna focus on the growth of the plant. We're gonna focus on the 10 that is the phosphorus and the 10 that is the uh, potassium. That's gonna concentrate on just what the, it says, ultra bloom. So for the veggie and herb growers, this one is called tomato and vegetable food. This is a, a great, um, uh, fertilizer to start everything off with. Uh, when your fruit, your vegetables start to produce fruit, that's when you stop fertilizing. So it focuses its uh, attention, the plant's attention on the fruit rather than the growth. This is dolomite lime. I put dolomite lime in my veggie gardening. Um, it has calcium and magnesium in it. Uh, to help support good, strong, uh, healthy cells for your plants to help help create a good, strong plant. I also use azomite. Azomite are trace minerals that uh, will help your plants store nutrients. Nutrients are very important. That's what's, what's feeding and, and supporting your plants. Um, it also enhances the flavor of all of your edibles. Uh, I started using it about nine, 10 years ago, and it just blew me away the difference of the flavor of my edibles. And I will never not use it on my veggie garden and herb garden. I just started berries. using it two years ago when I met Holly. It's amazing the difference. It's, it's so worth it. I've had many, many customers come in and say that they are really um, amazed at the difference. So it's not just my taste. And this is calcium, this is oyster shell. So if you're not able to do the dolomite line, at least get the calcium uh, on your uh, plants. And calcium is important for every plant. Doesn't matter if it's inedible, every single plant. This is going to help uh, create good, strong plant cells, which are going to create a good, strong, healthier plant. So that's oyster shell or calcium. This is a, a liquid fertilizer. This is a tomato fertilizer, but it can be used on other things. It's, it's high on that um, phos the phosphorus, uh, low on the nitrogen and the potassium. Again, this is a water soluble um, fertilizer. You can mix it in your water in your watering can to, to water in. And you can do that in conjunction with these, these other, if, you're, if you use your start, you use your tomato and veggie food in, in your soil when you're planting. Um, it's, it's a slow release, it's an organic, um, but it is going to eventually use this up once we're you know, hot in the summer and we're watering more frequently, a lot more nutrition is being flushed out as well as being used by the, the actively growing plants. So a water soluble is going to be more readily available for your plants to give them that, that quick boost. And keep in mind, these are all organic, so you're not going to burn your plants. Uh, it, it, a synthetic could burn a plant or over force it to grow and that would become a, a weaker plant. These are all organic so mixing them up is not going to be an issue. This is one called Bloom. Again it's going to be doing the same job as, oops, as the Ultra Bloom. Um, focusing on the flowers and the buds. Now we've got, we talked about doing your gardening, you're going to have pests at some point. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just nature. But we do have products to take care of that. This one is one that we use um, for a lot of stuff. This is Captain Jack's Dead Bug. Uh, this is for organic gardening if you need to use it on your vegetables or herbs. Uh, 
again, this, this is Captain Jacks. But we do have um, a class um, that was done by the general manager, Trevor, here. Um, a lot of good information. He also shows some, some pictures of pests and diseases to help you identify what you're working with. Um, so you can find that in other past classes, either on our website or on YouTube. Okay, let's show some uh, examples of uh, styles of gardening uh, on your balcony. Let's pull the uh, fiber crete. This is going to be a very large fiber crete container. This, this is going to be focusing on screening. If you've got a neighbor that, that you just don't want them watching you enjoy your balcony, then we'll, we'll put a little screening up. You can do a vine with a little lattice support. So you can see that if this is along the side of your balcony, you get your plant growing up. And of course you want to make sure it's something that's going to be evergreen. Otherwise you only have privacy a little bit of the time. This akebia is semi-evergreen, meaning that um, it'll usually hang on to its leaves until it's pushing out its new fresh growth. And it could very well be evergreen, uh, uh, you know, if you're in a more protected situation. Another good example might be an evergreen clematis. The Armandii's are beautiful. We just don't have one to show you right now, but they're going to have a beautiful, long, glossy foliage with uh, copper new growth. And they will be one of your first blooming uh, vines in the spring. Very fragrant, very beautiful, big white flowers. Now this is a bamboo rufa. This particular one is a clumping one, so it's not going to go nuts uh, all over the place. Um, it will eventually fill this, this container up. It will get uh, about six to eight feet tall, very prunable. Um, Keep in mind that this container is already two feet tall. So you're going to want to consider your headroom if you have a balcony mm -hmm, above you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's bamboo rufa. This next one is Taxus David. Now this I would put maybe three in and then they would fill up the container. It's a beautiful Taxus. Uh, it's got a, a, a new growth that's yellow and green variegated. I have this in my garden and I just love it. It can take some sun or um, shade. Of course, if you have three across, you're gonna get a nice screen growing in, mm -hmm. but especially when they're young plants, you're still gonna have some space if you wanna put in some low growing annuals in here for some color, you can certainly add Absolutely. Those. Next. This is a pen, uh, pencil point juniper. Whoops. Um, again, this one, I'd put maybe three in here. They get about a foot to a uh, foot and a half wide. Oh, six, eight feet tall. Um, and again, what uh, Sarah said, you know, add some cascading um, uh, annuals for some all season color. And that one would be, in the, would be for the sun. Here's Let's, a little bit more gold foliage, brighten it up. This is a bit of a, a feathery foliage. Let's see which one it is. This is Melody, Melody Hinoki Cypress. You can see the foliage is kind of kind of feathery. It's got a great texture, great color. There are so many Hinoki Cypress that are just beautiful. Yes, they are. They're just that graceful feathery uh, foliage. And that is what we have for um, screening. Now, um, other things you might want to do would be uh, maybe on a smaller scale. You can use stands. So layer your layer your stands, layer your plants. These will take up a little bit of space. And keep in mind, in the summer months, you can use house plants. Have, oops, have some fun with house plants. Something you wouldn't normally see in, I'm going to do the banana here. <laughs> Let's do that one there. Something you wouldn't normally be able to do all year, but 
it's fun to play around with them for for the summer months. Now you want to layer on a small space or a balcony. And what you're doing is um, you're allowing more space for the foliage. So they're not competing to uh, grow beautifully. They have their own space now to do that. And the same is with container gardening. You want to do the layering so you have more space. If you're doing things in individual pots like this, you also get more airflow, which is going to help keep down a lot of pest issues, mm -hmm. fungal issues, yep. things like that. Now this is a red banana up here. Beautiful foliage, glossy red and green. It will get much larger, beautiful foliage. This is a Spathophyllum, also known as a peace lily. See those gorgeous white flowers? There we go. put against my blue. There we go. Glossy leaves again. This would be more for a shaded balcony. This is an anthurium. Look at that. They come in all kinds of colors. Pinks, purples, whites, creams, black, red. That's an anthurium. Definitely that, be, that tropical look. Yeah, that would be for a little more lit up area. Now we mentioned uh, before vegetable gardening. You can do tomatoes. You can do just about anything. I do all my gardening in containers in my driveway. If, if any of you have seen those classes that I've talked about that. I have a lot of um, veggies and herbs in my driveway. This is a Rapunzel uh, tomato. It's going to be a um, cherry tomato. It is the only cherry tomato I will grow. It is delicious. It can be grown as a hanging basket. As you see, she's going to droop for you. Uh, I try to get mine to be sturdy. When I plant it, I, I uh, put mine in a container rather than a hanging basket. Um, and I, I bury it deep and I only have three three leaves on it and pinch the top off and it gets it sturdier but it still wants to you know reach out and grab you. Now a lot of these vegetables are going to want full sun. Um, they're going to perform better if you get at least six hours of direct sun but for some of these guys the tomatoes the more the better. You want to talk a little bit about indeterminate versus determinate on it, tomatoes? Determinate tomatoes um, are going to get about five fish feet tall, they, they, you know that the size they're going to get. Indeterminate, it's a guess. Some of them can get 12 feet tall. Um, you just won't know. This is a patio one. This one only gets about three feet. This one's actually called patio. <laughs> so they have a determined height that they're getting. They yeah. have pretty much a determined <laughs> amount of fruit they're going to grow. Yeah. And you're going to get your tomatoes all kind of at, at one time, but it's a great one as a space saver. You can get that those homegrown tomatoes that taste amazing. Now I want to show you an example of something that happens with tomatoes. This is called septoria. I don't know if you can see that. You see the yellow with the brown spotting? That's septoria. That's caused, that's a fungal issue. That is caused from excess moisture, which it's just part of what happens with tomatoes. I take the affected areas off and I spray with copper. Uh, don't spray if it's got flowers. If it's just an occasional flower and you need to get that thing sprayed, put your gloved hand over the flowers. Do not put spray on, on the um, flowers. With any tomato, it's always good to take off the lower leaves that have the potential to touch the soil. They're more likely to, to get disease and pests from the soil. Um, and we also want them to have plenty of airflow. Here we tend to be a little humid, um, which is great for fungal issues. Yep. So that's why we have products. <laughs> taking these, these lower leaves off and any little growth suckers off is going to keep the bottom of your plant open and you get you a lot of airflow. And that's going to keep you from having a lot of those, those issues. How about a blueberry? How about a blueberry? How about a blueberry? I have blueberries in the ground and in containers. They do well 
both ways. This is a southern bluebell. She's going to give you delicious blueberries. What do you have there? I have the new Midnight Cascade. So, oh, you wanted the exciting one to talk about. I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to snag one of these up and see how it does. Um, you could put one of these in a hanging basket if you had a big, yeah. big enough, deep, deep enough one. Um, blueberries can... like very acidic soil. We have, a, so I don't think we brought an example of the, the um, estimates, no. No, but we have a, we have a soil for um, azaleas, camellias. It does have blueberry picture on it. And they love that soil. They thrive in that soil. So when you're doing it containers, go go for that different so, so, soil if you're doing blueberries. It's an acidic soil. It's great for any ericaceous uh, plants. Now, uh, herb, herb gardening. She's going to put together an herb garden as well. And I love just walking out my front door and clipping all my herbs right when I need to use them uh, when I'm cooking. Uh, this is one of my favorite um, times. This is the only one my husband and I grow. Uh, we are um, avid cooks, uh, so very particular about what we, we grow and consume and use. This one's called Foxley. It's, it's a delicious thyme, uh, full flavored. Oh, it's just one of the best times ever. It's also beautiful. It's variegated, has, has cream splotches and edging. So you've got an ornamental plant along with a delicious one. Yeah. And then this is, this is marjoram. This is a golden marjoram. Now, if this was in more light, this would be a little golder than it is now. So uh, herbs do like to be in the light. And then I, I grabbed some cilantro. Um, I'm kind of going for a little bit of a Mexican food container when I, when I put it together. So so I grabbed some things that work well for that. Cilantro, um, of course, most, most people want cilantro for the leaves. If you let it go to flower, um, the seeds will be coriander. Um, so you can also harvest that. Um, but it's not, it, it doesn't take a long time for it to, to bolt and go, go to flower and seed. So uh, what you can do is plant your plant but then also maybe pick up some seeds and then a couple of little, little bare spots you have, put a few seeds in a little clump. Um, so you get some, some new fresh growth coming on for when, when this one's kind of done. Uh, keep in mind with cilantro, it wants to be in a cooler situation. I have um, Japanese maples in containers in my driveway where I garden as well, so that I can put those that require a cooler situation under them. Uh, so they get dappled light. Uh, did you talk about when to harvest them? When you want to harvest them, it's between six and eight inches tall, and you usually get about five harvests out of each plant. So think of that in terms of when you want to uh, start uh, planting others to take their place. So you can just cut cut down the ways, but but leave a leave a little space um, down here at the bottom for new growth to come up. Um, if you are gardening in a more shaded area, there are some herbs that, that will work for you. Um, you know, cilantro, if it gets a few hours of sun, um, should do fine. Uh, parsley is another one that can be somewhat shaded, doesn't need quite as much sun. Do um, you have any other examples of shadier herbs? Uh, those, those, are, those are pretty good ones for the shade, yeah. yeah. Or we're getting to a warmer part of the year for it, but if you were gardening in a shady, a shadier area, maybe just a couple hours of sun, um, some of those the cool crops like like lettuce, uh, spinach, they they'll last a little bit longer into the season if they especially get a little protection from the afternoon sun. Now, what what you would probably want want to do with um, your garden, your containers on your balcony, is get them lifted up off of the surface of the balcony. That will help with drainage and will also help not get those uh, rings that pots make. Uh, you can use things like these are just little rubber squares that we have to lift them up. Just something simple. If you have a, a, a wood flooring on your, your balcony or something else that could, could maybe um, rot or get some, some molding issues, 
you want to get some airflow under that pot so it dries out after it drains yeah. so you don't just have water sitting on the balcony all the time because again with all that moisture you can start uh, some fungal issues you know mildews septoria you just don't don't make it harder on yourself this is a trivet you see how the little short legs just plop your pot on that that's another option these are fun options this is the claw these are little uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> These are little claws. Looks like little dragon claws that you'd sit your pot they on. They come in a box of three, so you make a little triangle, put your pot on it, they stick out looking just adorable. All right. This is for those that have a little sense of humor. <laughs> this is the little booty ones. <laughs> little booty pot lifters. Those are always a popular one. And then we've got these. Now, this one, see all these little... I gotta get See all these little spikes? They're in little segments. So you break these off to fit the size of your pot. And that's gonna get everything off the surface. And then we've got the ones with the wheels. Now these are great caddies for the heavy ones. If you need to move them, you just put your pot on here and they scoot around. That's a, a great one. Then they've got a little break. You put the tab down for the brakes. So those are great options for lifting your container up and not creating issues. Why don't we put together a balcony? All right, let's play. We're going to build a balcony for you. Okay, so we're not going to take the time to actually put soil in and plant everything because we've had so much to talk about. Um, so we're just going to mock plant them for you. But I'm going to start with um, a, a, my biggest pot here, sun, sun conditions for at least six hours of direct sunlight. Um, and I'm going to do some perennials. Keep in mind when you're planting per perennials in a container that they, a bigger, faster growing plant, it may outgrow your container quickly. Maybe you're working with a, with a patio situation and you have a yard you can move stuff out into. That's great. Every couple of years, you might swap out a couple plants, put some fresh new babies in and you're fine. If you only have your balcony, then you really wanna read those plant shapes and make sure that it's not gonna outgrow your space. Um, so keep that in mind. Okay, you're going to plant up your first big one, right? I'm going to plant my first big one, my sun container. So I was charmed by this, this lovely potentilla creme brulee. She's got beautiful white flowers on here for that sparkle. But when she's done blooming, the foliage is really pretty as well. Um, this gal will get three, three and a half feet tall, three feet wide. So, you know, eventually, she may fill up a pot like this or need to be moved out into a landscape. Um, so just consider that when you're, when you're choosing your plants. Next, I, I chose this, this lovely Pieris. Um, this does flower, it gets white flowers in spring. Uh, but one of the things that we love it for is this bright red green growth. It's beautiful. So um, you can prune on these. They can get rather large. Um, this one can get six by six feet, um, but you can size control it by, by pruning on it. And then um, if you want flowering, make sure that you're, you're pruning soon after the flowers are done so it gets its new growth this season and the, the blooms come on, on this season's growth next year. So, that, so that's called um, blooming on old wood. So you need to have this growth growing this year to set its buds to grow to bloom next year. But if you're only doing it for the foliage color, you can really print it at any time and, and, and get that new foliage coming up. That's, that's the only Pieris I will grow in my yard and I grow it specifically for that foliage color. Next I chose a, a salvia. Salvias um, are a long, long bloomer. And you can see that we have some, some lovely blooming flowers right here. We've got some butted up ones on the side. So when this one's all done, we can go cut this one off and let these side ones come up. When, when it gets, you know, a lot, of, a lot of this bloom is done, you can cut it that quite a ways and let it flush out again, and you'll often get a second bloom out of it. And remember fertilizer. 
for fertilizing, yes. For like the, it takes it takes a lot of energy for for these plants to bloom. So when you um, cut it back, give it a good dose of food so we can work on put it, putting out new growth and, and new buds. Now this one, salvias, especially hummingbirds love them. You're gonna see bees on them as well. Pollinators in general really like, like salvias. But if you wanna attract hummingbirds, salvia is one of your number one choices. Yes, I wanted to throw a little um, different foliage color in there. Some grassy texture, so we've got this brown sedge. Some people think it looks dead. I love it because it really stands out against all that other green foliage. So I'm gonna tuck that to the center. And you, you may notice um, if you've taken our uh, classes on the, the thriller, spiller, spillers, another one you can find on our website or on YouTube. Um, well, they, they talk about thrillers being your height, fillers being your, your middle, and spillers going over the edge. Um, another way you can look at this is look at what viewpoint you're going to see it, put your tallest in the back from where you're going to see it, and stair step down. So I put my, my tallest plant in the back corner off to the side because I'm going to be viewing it more from the middle of my patio. Um, sometimes grasses are going to be your thriller, your tall one, in a smaller container, but in this case, I've got some shrubs that are going to get bigger. So I'm kind of using this as a filler in the center. And I chose a, a dianthus, another one that blooms for a long time. When it's done, you can kind of shear it back and it'll put out some, some new growth, fertilize it. Um, you'll get a, get a lot of color out of that guy. And then one of Holly's favorite plants, this is a Lizomachia. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with Creeping Jenny. This is a relative of that called Waikiki Sunset. Or Walkabout Sunset. Or Walkabout Sunset, <laughs> formerly known as Walkabout Sunset. For whatever reason, they changed the name on us. Um, nice mounding trailer um, and, and a good hardy perennial in our, our area. So I love adding chartreuse foliage. It just brightens everything up. This has a really pretty variegation on it. It also gets cl clusters of bright yellow flowers. Um, and I'll let Holly talk more about that one, but I'm gonna put that on my front corner here as a spiller. Okay, all right. right. So uh, let me show you what I've done. She's doing her shade garden over on that side. I sometimes like to just put a statement plant in a container. So that's what I've done with this hydrangea. This is Seaside Serenade. It's a beautiful hydrangea. Uh, I just wanted to make a statement all by itself and get about three feet tall and be beautiful. This is, uh, uh, just so we mentioned this, Sarah's doing a sun container area. I'm doing a shade container area. I don't know if that had been mentioned. It wasn't paid attention. <laughs> so this is a Kong coleus. This is a nonstop mocha begonia. This is a male, a cristata, a male uh, fern. And this is a uh, hardy fuchsia called Yolanda Prairie. Beautiful colors and textures. Um, I just I just love oranges and pinks. And I'm going to put together a container that for now, this is a fascia. This is going to be a party. I'm also going to put a geranium genii. This has a bright chartreuse foliage with red stems and it's going to have uh, red and purple flowers. Now, I, in the future, I want my fascia to be the tall six feet it can get, my fuchsia genii to be its skirt as the filler, and then the lysomachia as its filler. Now, it's beautiful variegation with that yellow flower that has kind of a reddish center to it. It's very showy. It is evergreen. Uh, I have this bordering some of my, uh, one of my beds, and then I have it as underplanting under hydrangeas and deep purple roadies, so it offsets those uh, plants with its bright brightness. Um, one of my favorites, it's great in a hanging basket, so you have an evergreen hanging basket all year round. It will get a little bronze to it in the winter time, but I like that as well. 
uh, once it starts, once it's established and starts to bloom, it just blooms its cool head off for a while where it's just solid yellows and then sporadically until it gets really, really cold out. So you'll have something going on with it. So in the future, this is going to be a big fascia with foliage like this. This will be a delicate, dainty um, skirt around it with the, the full thriller uh, uh, spiller of the, um, the Samachia. But I've got gaps now. So until things get bigger, I'm going to add some annuals. This is another polius. I just love how red this polius is, and it's going to offset the red stems of that fuchsia. So I'm going to poke that in there. Oh, it's so good. And then two red blooming uh, New Guinea uh, uh, impatiens. So I'm going to poke one in here, and it's going to both in here. There's room. So those are going to give off, make a polar pot and uh, give off some color for now until the perennial part of this pot fills it up and uh, uh, is all that will be needed. Uh, so on top of this, let's put some height. And you can see how we have different heights on our pots. So we're doing that, that staggering, you know, tall, medium, and low. So let's put some... Uh, other things on our balcony. Okay. I'm going to put a begonia up here. This is a gorgeous peach begonia. Again, she's on the shady side. Um, these things can handle a little bit of morning sun. Probably best if they're not in the in the hot afternoon sun. It's a little more intense. And let's not forget the birds. We put a hummingbird feeder up. Let's go. Let's not forget us. Put a little, uh, little, little pink <laughs> beverage there. So I'm just going to real quick talk about my, um, I did more of an annual container. This creeping, this is the creeping venue I was talking about, the other Lysimachia, and other Lysimachia, there are plenty of them. Um, so that that will probably come, come back in your container, but I did put a Cali Um uh, This really loves sun, um, and it will be colorful until a frost gets it. We've got a lovely dahlia that's going to bloom its head off, especially if you're deadheading it. And then I added a heliotrope. This is one of my favorites. It's got beautiful purple flowers that are very fragrant. And in a space like this where I'm going to be spending some time, I love to put some fragrant bloomers. Um, you could also get plants with very fragrant foliage. So that's, you know, the scent is also another consideration. Um, and I think so, since I'm standing here with my container still, I think I'll, I'll plant up my my, my veggie herb pot, my old Mexican cooking pot. So we have our patio tomato we were talking about. Um, I already took off, removed off most of this. I think I'm going to take off another leaf here at the bottom. I brought my clippers so I wouldn't be yanking all stuff and I didn't do it. Um, with tomatoes, if you look at them close, you'll see there's little hairs on, on the stem. You can plant tomatoes a little deeper and those hairs will turn into roots which gives you a more robust root system. So that's why I took that extra leaf off so I can plant a couple more inches down and get more, more of a root system going. Keep in mind they need the airflow so I'm in and it's going to grow so I'm going to give this little guy a little space in the back here. I've got my El Jefe Jalapeno. This is one that you can harvest and use green or red. Um, yeah. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> difference in flavor between green and red. There it really isn't a difference in flavor. It's just the, the difference in the coloration. Um, just keep in mind with jalapenos, there's so many different kinds um, that there are different heat levels. And sometimes it's just going to say jalapeno. So, you know, they're, they're not very good about the, the tags on a lot of things. So just keep in mind, sometimes it's a guessing game on if you're getting a hot one or an extra hot one. So I'm going to put that in the back next to my tomato in the corner so they can have a little space between each other. Then I'm going to put my, my herbs more toward the front. 
my cilantro nuts plus my cilantro kind of in the middle. And then I've got my foxley thyme, pretty variegation. And my golden marjoram that is going to give me a little bit more of that lime to play off uh, of the others. These guys will kind of be mounding spillers um, on the front end. Okay, well, okay, so put up a sun basket, maybe. You've got your shape basket. I should probably put up a sun basket. Oh, you want the chimes up? Okay. <laughs> let's see if she can do it without being too noisy. <laughs> we had a practice session on this. <laughs> I was noisy. I love to listen to my wind chimes when it when the breeze goes through. It's a very calming sound when you're sitting out on your patio and you've got a little breeze going. Okay, how about a glorious sun basket? <laughs> Just because I'm the shortest one in the car between me, I'm short. I am average, thank you. <laughs> There's some color for us. And then do I'm gonna um, just plop my little Japanese maple up here. Holly can talk about Japanese maples and which ones would work best for this sort of situation. The best thing for this, this is a weeping Japanese maple. So they're not gonna get really tall. They'll get wider, but they're not gonna get really tall. You can also do, um, if you want something more upright, uh, you can do a Rhode Island red, they stay very short, or you can do um, a Shana. Shana stays fairly short and narrow. Um, you know, come on in and we can uh, show you the, the shorties. Yeah, we have some people with a lot of experience with out in the trees and shrubs, and so um, they can really help you pick out the right, right appropriate plant for your space. And maples make a really good container uh, tree because they can take a more, uh, 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 what am I trying to say? Um, they can be root bound. Oh, more restriction yeah. to the root system. Yeah, yeah, for a longer time than most things. So we have some color bowls too. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one with some sempervivums, uh, all kinds of succulents. I've got a variegation going on that offsets the semp. Um, really beautiful combination. Uh, this is going to go on the outer edge, even though I have a shade um, contained on the back side, chances are your front of your balcony is going to have the sun. So these are good cold tolerance succulents. Um, if you wanted to do more of an annual thing or maybe have a container that you take in in the winter, you can do some of the non-hardy ones that you would find in our houseplant greenhouse. This is a very chartreuse Campania Dixon's Gold. You can see the color of the flowers there. Um, it's sometimes it's nice just to have all of one thing just to make a bold statement. And the color. Here's the Callies with one little marigold in there. Hummers love these. All that bright color. Look at that. Once these grow and fill in, you're just going to have a big mound of color sitting on, on your balcony. You could also put this up on a plant stand if you want to yep. see it cascade over. Yep. Let's see. I think uh, we have a couple little accessories we could put up. Oh, yeah. These creep her out, but I love them. <laughs> little faces, little statuey faces. We'll put one there. Where's the other one though? I, I, have, I hit it so I didn't have to look at it. I have the giant version of this one in my woodsy garden. And it's what greets you when you drive up my driveway. We're going to check that out. We have all sorts of styles and sizes of statuary. Um, you can do dragons, you can do squirrels. Uh, we have a big, a big bald eagle statue. We get fire yeah. hydrants. Um, there's all sorts of stuff. You could add um, a bird bath if you have the, the space for it and don't mind birds splashing on your patio. All right, I think we're ready for questions. Um, while you pour a drink for yourselves and not for me, rude, but that's okay. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's apple cider. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really amazing all of the different things that you put in, you know, I am 
uh, lucky enough to have a yard, but I still have a back porch and there's tons of inspiration. Like I want to go fancy up my back porch that really only has a few kind of weak pots now looking at what you guys created. So thank you for all the tips and inspiration. It's amazing. Um, and so many versatile things, things that we can change out, new things, you know, perennials that we can keep around for a while. Super exciting. Um, so I've got some questions after you, you know, start your little party there. <laughs> um, so we talked about products in the beginning that help kind of bug control. Somebody mentioned, we talked about the Captain Jacks. Um, but somebody mentioned specifically aphids. What's a good product to manage those? Good question. Um, uh, Captain Jack's is great for managing uh, aphids. Also, neem, anything with neem in it is great for uh, aphids. We've probably got maybe four products here that we could recommend. Okay, excellent. Good to know. And then there was, uh, you were talking about soils, and you mentioned that there were um, some some ingredients that can be harmful in burn plants. I missed that information because I was answering questions. Do you recall what you said <laughs> 40 minutes ago, um, what um, those were? What, what, we're I think that was when we were talking about fertilizers. Um, uh, the organics don't burn, but some synthetics can burn. Now, of course, it's up to you if you want to go organic or synthetic. Um, synthetics, you can sometimes get that like big burst of, of growth. Um, it's a little less expensive, maybe less smelly. Um, so it really depends on what, what you're going for. Um, we like to use the, the organics. We just like to keep everything organic in, in our yards and especially for our edibles. So personal choice, um, we do have both options available. And if you do choose the synthetic you know, people ask if they can use it on their annuals. I, I have no trouble with that. I'm an organic gardener. That's just what I've chosen to be. But if you want to use a synthetic on your annuals, annuals are meant to bloom themselves to death. So go for it. They've got one season to set their flowers and, and seeds, even if they're sterile, that the plant still thinks that's its goal. Um, so it's going to bloom and bloom and bloom, and it needs plenty of energy to do that. So you want to give it the food that is going to help it produce all of those flowers for you. Um, so a synthetic can certainly do that. Um, you're not likely to be eating your annual flowering plants, probably. Um, so you're not having to worry about what's going into your system. Um, so, but you know, a lot of people steer more toward organics with their edibles, um, your herbs, your veggies, your fruits, those kind of things. Again, personal preference. Excellent. Um, I got so excited and, well, jealous about your drinks, but I got so excited <laughs> to talking about questions that I forgot to um, mention uh, the class discount because I know some of us have places to be and we start kind of dropping off during the questions. So before everybody goes, um, let me just kind of give some information real quick before we continue on with questions. Um, we are, as normal, offering a class discount with this class. Um, we're going to do 20% off any wooden containers and plastic containers, um, lightweight stuff that's great for your uh, balconies and patios. Um, we also have all of our heavy ceramics, like what the ladies have on their balcony right now. Um, those are all 50% off as well. We also have a line called Fibercrete that looks like ceramic, but it's really lightweight. Those are 50% off as well. So lots of great options to kind of get you started, um, depending on what conditions you have at home. Um, and then there's tons of plants. We are super blessed in the nursery right now to be fully stocked. Um, we know a lot of our um, neighboring nurseries, at least out here in Western Washington, are having a really hard time getting product. And we are too. We kind of took the hoarding um, <laughs> way to go, um, which we don't regret. Sorry, other nurseries. Um, but we have a huge variety of products right now from annuals to veggies to tomatoes, herbs, um, 
perennials, trees. We've got all kinds of stuff. And we have a great knowledgeable staff that can help give you recommendations outside of what the ladies talked about today um, that will fit your specific conditions. I know there's been lots of questions about Japanese maples specifically because they're beautiful. Um, they're exciting that it's something you can actually put in containers on your porch or patio. Um, and we've got a lot of people that can help kind of point you in the right direction with different varieties, depending on what you're looking for, your aesthetic preference, lighting conditions, all that kind of stuff. So um, hopefully you'll have a chance to make it down to the nursery. That discount starts today and it goes all the way through Friday the 18th. Um, and we, all you have to do is mention that you were in the class to one of our cashiers and they'll get you that 20% off. Um, and then as always, we always record these classes. There was a lot of information today. So we'll post it oh, there today up on our website as well as our YouTube channel. So you can go back, pause, rewind, whatever to catch all the information you missed. Um, and we're always here to help. I did my best to throw the class handout and the list of plants that the ladies talked about today. Um, but that's also on our class website, um, sunnysidenursery.net. Um, and on our classes page. So you can get all that information and we're always happy to help. Shoot us an email if there's a question that doesn't get answered um, or something that pops up later, we would love to chat with you about it. So, um, okay, back to questions. Thanks for that brief intermission there. Sorry to get all my, my info out. Um, so we were talking about watering, you know, realistically, how much can you water? Um, where's your water source coming from? But a really great question came up about how do you make sure that you're not watering your neighbors below, that your plants get enough water without drowning out the people below you? Well, that's a good question. Um, you can, you know, if you've got a container this big and you put a gallon of water in it, that's going to get probably in enough root system without pouring out all over. It all depends on your balcony. Some balconies are built where they, when they drip, they drip past your, your neighbor. You know, they drip out and past. So it depends on your balcony. Um, for uh, plants that require more moisture, you're, you're, you're gonna have to have some come out. Uh, it just depends on, on, on your balcony. It's something we did, didn't think to bring in. Um, you can put a plant saucer underneath your pot. So the saucer can catch any any overflow you have that's coming out of your pot whether that, rather than it running all over. But keep in mind that doesn't necessarily work for everything because that's going to create extra moisture for that plant. So if it's a drought tolerant plant and it's just sitting in this puddle for, for a week, um, that might not be good. So it just depends on the plant. But as, as you are taking care of your containers and your plants, you'll get to know them better. If you're checking, if you're sticking your fingers down in the soil to see where the moisture levels are. Um, if you, if the top couple inches of, of soil are moist, you don't need to water. Um, and keep in mind that the top is going to dry out first. So if that's moist, you've got a lot of moisture down, down lower if you've been watering deeply. And what's a good way to test that? Um, did you guys talk about, you know, like how far down you should test the soil to see if it actually needs water? Um, what's a good way to know when it's time? Get your finger in there. That's, it's a good, another good question. Get your finger in there. This is always the best water meter. So get in there two, three inches. If it's wet, then it's guaranteed to be wet a little farther down. So you don't have to water. You can purchase a moisture meter they have prongs that go down probably maybe six, eight inches. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, so especially when you're first learning your containers and your plants, that might be a helpful tool, but it doesn't, doesn't take the place of getting your fingers in there. It, um, or hefting pots. If, if they're not big pots, you know, especially with the hanging baskets, we're always checking our hanging baskets because they're, they're hanging over our heads generally. We're, we're lifting them from the bottom to see what the weight is like. The more you do that, the more you get used to what it feels like when it's getting light or when it's freshly watered and it's heavy. With the hanging basket, if you have to put a lot of effort, a lot of muscle into it, it's heavy. You've got water in there. If, if you go to put your tips of your finger there and it's about to fall off, you got to water. That, that means it's light. Excellent. Um, so we talked about perennials um, going in to pots. How, what do you do when they start kind of overtaking the pot? Um, can you prune them to kind of keep them cut, 
you know, to size the way you want them? When do you know if it's time to move them out of that pot? That's another good question. Um, there's different things. It depends on your plants. Like for instance, the fatsia and the fuchsia that I put in this container that I want to eventually uh, fill that corner of my balcony, uh, they're very prunable. So you can keep them pruned uh, or depending on the space of your balcony, you can put these casters with the wheels on them and just slowly spread them as they grow and get bigger. So it just depends on the, the space you're working with. You don't want to do, go too crazy. You don't want to put a shrub that, that it's genetic, say, I'm growing to 10 feet tall and try to keep it at three feet. Yeah. It's just going to bite you and it's going to be growing an extensive root system in a very confined space. Yeah. Keep so you don't want to, if you have something that can grow to four feet and you wanted to keep it more at three feet, that's a little bit more doable. Yeah. Keep in mind when you're picking your plants out that you're aware of the size that they do mature to. Excellent. Um, here's an interesting and challenging question. Um, we talk about keeping, you know, in lawns or yards, keeping uh, deer and rabbits and things out, but somebody mentioned squirrels that like to come uh, kind of attack their balcony. They said mean squirrels. I'm envisioning a very vicious squirrel attacking their pots right now. Um, so do, <laughs> do you have any tips on um, how to keep specifically squirrels out of your container so they don't kind of turn your whole garden upside down and crazy? Well, if, if any of you out there have seen any of the classes, you know I always jump on the urine thing. I don't recommend that for balconies. <laughs> <laughs> For squirrels, you can put little sharp things like like holly branches or barberry branches on the surface of your pots, and that's going to prick them, and they're not going to want to um, do that again because it's going to hurt. Excellent. Um, We've been talking about fertilizers. Um, somebody asked if there's a specific, should you do a soil test before you apply specific uh, fertilizers? Is it okay to just use on your soils? How do you go about that? Uh, well, when, when you're putting the soil in originally, it's going to have what's required for those plants. Uh, with each year, you're going to need to fertilize anywhere. Anyway, because each year the plants are going to use all the nutrients that are in that soil. So you need to add more nutrients to that soil with each year. Yeah, that's important with in-ground planting, but even more so in a container because they have limited resources. They can't reach their roots out to farther and farther and down into the ground. They've only got this small amount of soil. So if they deplete that soil and you're not adding nutrition back to it, they're just going to starve and, and, and you're going to start seeing issues with, the, with the, the leaves, with them just not being vigorous, with them not performing how you'd like and more pest and disease pressure because the the plant is stressed yeah and speaking of pests um and disease treatments um can you talk about some good treatments that are safe for your plants but also for the pollinators i know a lot of us are concerned about keeping the bees safe um, and the pollinators that like to visit a lot of these plants you mentioned can you recommend some good products that will keep all of those pollinators safe mentioned the Captain Jacks for organic gardening, but again, not for things in flower. Uh, what you can do is um, get some 100% uh, neem oil, and this is what uh, I, I have done many times. 100% neem oil with some Dawn dish soap mixed in water, and you're doing a soil drench. And what's going to happen is your plant's going to draw up that uh, uh, the active ingredient and it's uh, the critters are going to want to feed the plant off the plant, but it's going to consume that and then will die. And one of the things with the Captain Jacks is what it's targeting are suckers and chewers. Um, so your bees that are going into the flowers are not going to be eating the leaves like some of your pest insects. So it's, it's not going to harm them. You do not want to spray any of your pollinators directly. So um, it, it's often a good idea to wait and spray in the evening when the pollinators have gone to bed, it's drying on your plant overnight, and when they come back out in the morning, you don't have that, that wet um, spray on, on your plants. And, and, and I don't know, I can't remember if I mentioned, what I had talked about with the neem and the dawn, you put it in the soil. You don't, don't spray with it, you put it in the soil. 
So we talked a little bit about blueberries and the kind of acidic soil that they like, but what kind of fertilizer do potted blueberries prefer? We, uh, we have a uh, fertilizer for rhodi camellia, uh, which are ericaceous plants, meaning they are acidic lovers and blueberries are acidic lovers. Uh, that is a good organic fertilizer for them. Uh, you can also add some acidity by putting your coffee grounds on top of the soil. Excellent. Um, our questions seem to have slowed down. So um, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Again, if something pops up, please reach out. We would love to chat with you about plants. We love plants. So we're happy to discuss them with you too. I say that every class, but it's real. Um, so we would um, invite you to reach out via phone or email sunnysidenursery at msn.com. Um, and we're happy, Holly and Sarah will be here for the rest of the day. They're happy to answer some questions, especially if you have something specific specific going on or that you're looking for. Um, and then we'll be back next Saturday with Trevor. We're going to do pruning in summer um, next Saturday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So hopefully you can join us for that. We really appreciate everybody taking time out of their day to join us. Um, and we hope to see you later. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you. Enjoy your balcony.